a privilege to open up God's Word. I love singing that song about ancient words ever true. Thinking about the words that God Himself breathed in, the Scripture says, we had the honor and privilege of allowing Him to speak to all of us, including myself this morning. Let's turn in God's Word to Matthew chapter 5. We're in the sixth beatitude. And we'll focus on Matthew 5, 8 this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I've never struggled over one of the Beatitudes as much as I've struggled over this one to prepare the message that I believe God wants us to hear this morning because I've preached the Sermon on the Mount three different times at different churches. And God's really changed my heart on what this Beatitude means this morning. And so I'm admitting I preached it wrong before. And so hopefully we'll understand it the right way this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart. The synopsis of the sermon this morning is we're only made pure in heart by God. We can't make ourselves pure in heart. We're going to look at several verses in a moment through the Old Testament that talk about how evil our hearts are and that we cannot purify our own hearts. Only God can purify our hearts. And so many times when people get confused out of the passage in James 4 that we're going to study on Wednesday nights as we get to James chapter 4 and 5 in the next several Wednesday nights, but where it says to cleanse yourself and purify yourselves, you double-minded. And many people think we can purify ourselves. We'll talk about that in the study of James. We should desire to be righteous before God, but we cannot purify ourselves. We cannot take our filthy righteousness out and put clean, perfect, pure righteous inside of us. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, the very simple message this morning is that when God saves you, He purifies your heart. And that means since you are saved and have a clean heart, that you will see God one day. But the Greek tense of the verb, we'll see God, is a future middle, which means we can see God now, but see Him even greater one day. And so I hadn't had a chance to talk to Jim about this a lot this week with everything that's been going on this past week. But when Jim comes up and says we can see glimpses of God, but we'll see him in his fullness one day, that's exactly what this beatitude is talking about. Do we see glimpses of God today? And then one day, oh, we'll really see him for who he is. And I love the song we just sang, I stand in awe of him, but I agree with Brother Jim. I don't think we'll be standing when we see him face to face. I believe we'll be on our face before God because He's a holy, holy, holy God that we just sang about and that we'll be in awe of His presence that He would save us by His grace when we don't deserve that and we'll fall on our face and we will worship Him finally in spirit and in truth in the right way because we live in a fallen, evil world right now and we can't understand what it means to worship Him truly the way He wants us to worship Him until one day in glory. Matthew 5, we'll go through the first 12 verses again, but focus on Matthew 5, 8, the sixth beatitude. As I get to the beatitudes, as we've been doing in the past, I know we have a lot of visitors with us this morning, and we're glad you're here. We have a World Changers group with us from all over the United States, some from Georgia, some of their leaders, but it's great to have them. Ryan and I were at World Changers two weeks ago in Nashville, and then next July, we will host World Changers here the last week in July. And so be in prayer about that, but it's great to have our visitors from World Changers and other visitors with us. But what I'm going to ask you to do this morning is to help me out a little bit and re read responsively the results of each beatitude. They'll be in gold for you for those that sleep halfway through the sermon and don't pay attention to help you out this morning. Just joking, I slept through many a sermon when I was an immature believer in Christ. Actually, I wasn't a believer when I was sleeping, but uh, I understand that. I better scoot on before I get in trouble. All right, Matthew 5, <laughs> verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and he, when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, here's our first beatitude, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Here's the last two verses. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But our focus today, the sixth beatitude, is Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love the video that we've been showing before most of the sermons when I remember to let it play before I come up to the pulpit, that it says, they will see God, and then it repeats it. They will see God. Do we long to see God one day in all of His glory? Do we expect that could even happen today? Are we anxious like the Jews were, saying today could be the day, and we long to see Him for who He really is, and to truly worship Him in His physical presence for all eternity? I've started every Sermon on the Mount through the Beatitudes the same way on the first point. I've been redundant for a reason. I really want us to make sure we understand what it means to be blessed by God, what it means to have the approval of God. So here's the first point that if you've been with us through this sermon series so far, you've heard it many times. But number one, I am blessed because God saved me. The greatest blessing of all is to be saved by God. I, got, I, I prayed about it earlier in the service. I can't contain myself when I see somebody who was lost that gets saved, but I've been counseling a, a couple that's going to be married in a few weeks, and you'll see this at the end of the service, but to see someone who was lost and get saved and see the joy that God places inside of them and just beaming out of her face just blows me away, and we forget that God can save us, and He needs to save somebody here this morning if they will just let Him save them, and then we have His approval because He saved us. And so... Approved by God does not mean we earn it. We cannot earn the approval of God. And I believe so much we've heard preaching, I heard it preaching a lot when I was growing up, that we err on the side of the law. And it's all about, hey, you can't be saved because you keep doing this wrong. We forget that we're not saved by our works. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 spells it out. It's not of our works that anyone should boast. Now, once we are saved, we should have a desire to obey God. But I believe so often we've just erred on the side of the law and we forgot about grace. There is a balance in the Scripture. We're saved by grace to do good works, Ephesians 2.10 says, that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Who does the good works? God does in us. We can't do them on our own. Our best on our own, God says, is filthy rags in Isaiah. Our best on our own strength. And so the first point I want you to see from that Greek word makarios that we say in Latin, we get the Beatitudes from, blessed are. It's not happy, it's not fortunate, it is approved by God in the literal Greek language. But often preachers don't like to tell you the real meaning of that because when we say approval, we think we have to earn it. For a son to have the approval of the father, usually the son has to do certain things right. I felt like when I was younger that if I didn't excel in school or I wasn't the best athlete that somehow my father would not approve of me. I think so many times we paint the picture to children that they have to measure up for us to love them. I'm so thankful we don't have to measure up for God to love us. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us in our greatest weakness. At our worst moment, Scripture says, that's when God sent Christ to die for you and die for me. We are approved by God when we are saved. We become one of His children. And now we have the perfect love of a Heavenly Father. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less. His love for us is not based on what we do. Our lo His love for us is based on what He did on the cross of Calvary. And that doesn't change. So bask this morning in the love, unconditional love of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we should obey Him. Yes, we mourn the second beatitude when we sin because we want to please God in every way because we love Him more than life itself. But we do not earn a position in heaven one day. You know how many people that are religious but do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ think they have to go door to door and knock on your door and tell you about what it means to be a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon because if they do not do that, they cannot go to their heaven. We do not go door to door to earn our salvation. We should go door to door and share the gospel of Jesus Christ because we love Jesus and want the world to know about Him. But we don't earn it. It's not something we check off a list and say, okay, we deserve to go to heaven now. That's how most of the world sees the approval of God. Notice in verse 3 now, as we get to what it means in the second point this morning, to be pure in heart. Notice in verse 3, the first beatitude, it says, Blessed are the poor, and then the phrase, in spirit. 
It's not talking about physically poor. I'm glad that rich people can go to heaven too. But it's poor in spirit, which means we are nothing without Christ. In our spirit, we realize we are bankrupt spiritually without Jesus Christ. Then we looked at the second beatitude, which means because we are poor in spirit, because God has made us that way when he saved us, and we're bankrupt spiritually before God, when we do sin, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, and we are broken over it. And broken people weep over their sin. Why? Because when God saves us, we see God for who he is, we see ourselves for who we are, and we realize truly what took place on the cross at Calvary. And when we sin, we do not want Christ to have to suffer for what we deserve to go to hell and pay for that sin. So therefore we mourn over it. Then it leads us to the third beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Which means we're under the control of the Holy Spirit. We're not weak. We have the power of Almighty God flowing through us. Then the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be satisfied. They'll be comforted. We hunger to live right before God because He has made us right when He saved us by placing Jesus' perfection inside of us. His blameless, perfect righteousness. Then we looked at last week, blessed are the merciful, verse 7, for they shall receive mercy. When we are full of the mercies of God, we will extend those mercies to others. Now it's reminding us in the sixth beatitude that we're not just living for the here and now. We're living for what we will see one day and we will see it for all eternity. The fact that God would allow us to see Him for who He really is. Jim referenced the Old Testament a little bit about Moses and the fact that God hit him in a cleft and if Moses would have seen God, he would have died on the spot. So picture Jesus on the side of a mountain with His disciples and hundreds of other people that have gathered to see Jesus speak because of all the miracles Jesus was doing. He's addressing His disciples, but the religious leaders are there as well. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and people that have just shown up who are sitting there listening, and Jesus says, blessed are the pure. And I guarantee you the religious leaders said, right on. But then He said, in heart. And they were like, oh, wait a second, you got something wrong. Because for the religious people, purity meant something they could do on the outside. They had all their ceremonial washings they would go through. In fact, if you have your Bible, flip over to Matthew 15. Flip over. Just a few pages. The Pharisees get upset with Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. Because you had to go through all these ceremonial washings for their purity. Everything you could do on the outside. Matthew 15, verse 1, it says, The Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And Jesus is answering them and talks about all the things they're unclean about but don't realize. And then drop down to verse 10 of that same chapter. And he called the people to him and he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Now drop down to verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Verse 19, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Now some children are going to have fun with this when they get home with their parents. <laughs> I teach my kids to wash their hands before they eat, that's okay. But the religious leaders said that their purity before God came from what they could earn by their outward washings. I mean, priests had to go through a litany of washings before they could go into the Holy of Holies. And so, when Jesus says, blessed are the pure, they're saying, yeah, you're not getting it right. You haven't done all the things you're supposed to do. And then Jesus blows them away with the phrase, in heart. And we cannot purify our hearts. Only Jesus can. And I'm going to show that from the scriptures this morning. It's interesting in Matthew we see the word pure used three, three times. It's only used in the whole New Testament with the phrase pure in heart right here in Matthew 5 verse 8. The only time you see it with in heart. 
So many people, I believe I've done this in the past, have looked at this beatitude in the wrong light and think somehow we purify ourselves after we're saved, and that is the wrong interpretation of this passage of Scripture. I believe that this New Testament beatitude is referencing Psalms 24, which is next in your handout. Look at what Psalms 24 says in reference to what we're going to look at in the Sermon on the Mount. Psalms 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in His holy place? Who can stand in the presence of God? And then it says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. In the Old Testament, who could stand before God physically? No one. Because no one could do enough physical washings on the outside to make their hearts pure. Then it says, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. When we get in the Sermon on the Mount, we get down to Matthew 5, verse 33, we're going to look about what it means to not swear by an oath. So I believe several things in the Sermon on the Mount are referenced in Psalms 24. A little aside, hang on till I get to that part in the Sermon on the Mount, but it doesn't say not to make an oath, it says not to swear by an oath. There's so many people today that won't sign a covenant because they says it's unbiblical. No, it's okay to make an oath, but you don't have to swear by it. Your word should be enough. We'll look at that when we get to that passage of Scripture. But it says next in this passage of Scripture, verse 5 of Psalms 24, He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of His salvation. Verse 6, Such is the generations of those who seek Him. Matthew 6, 33. In the Sermon on the Mount. Who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Who seek to see God one day face to face. So I believe Matthew 5, 8 is a reference back to this Psalm 24, 3 through 6. Because of all of its references to not worshiping idols and to seeking after God. We'll get in the Sermon on the Mount that we should worship God and not money. We should not have idols before God. But verse 6 says that we should seek to see him face to face. And no one can stand in front of God until God has made that person's heart pure. So I believe the simple message of this psalm is talking about God's purity that he places inside of us at the moment of salvation. Hear this though. Purity in heart is not a quali qualification for salvation. It's a result of salvation. Because we don't do it. God does it in us. We'll talk about James 4 on Wednesday night, how it fits together that after we're saved, we desire to be pure, we desire to obey God, which is what it means to purify yourselves, you double-minded, you sinners, what James 4 says. But let's trace the Old Testament quickly this morning on what it means to have the heart as the center of man's being and what our hearts are apart from Christ. If you're lost this morning, you've never been saved, this is how God sees you, and He wants to take your heart your heart of flesh out and put in a new heart, a pure heart that only comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. Go back in your handout to Genesis 6, verse 5. First time we see the heart mentioned in the Old Testament. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time or continually. So on our best, our hearts are evil. And Scripture says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your mouth ever speaks something you can't believe came out? Or people around you cannot believe came out? Why? Because that's the evil that's in us, and it will come out. We are evil people. We like to see ourselves as good people. We like to compare ourselves to other people and think we're better than other people, so we're good moral people. Apart from Christ, we are evil to the core, Scripture says. Then we drop down to Genesis 8, verse 21. This is after the flood in the days of Noah. And it says, When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. Noah asked me one day if the world would ever flood again. My son, whose name Noah. Pretty ironic. No son, God promised with the rainbow that he would never flood the earth again. That's his covenant, his promise. And he says here, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart 
is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I've done. That passage says, God says, I'm not going to strike them down because they're just acting as a sinner that they were born into now from the fall of man. Their hearts are evil even from their youth. Get to Isaiah 1 on your handout. Isaiah 1 verse 5. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. All we're doing is living like a sinner because we are sinners. What amazes me is when Christians expect lost people to act right. You know why lost people act like they do? Because they're lost. And why do we expect them to honor God with their life if they haven't found Christ as their Savior? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now you tell me how you discipline your children when you tell them they've done wrong and they look at you and say, but God, Dad, you said my heart is evil and deceitful from the beginning. That's what Noah said to me about two weeks ago. Son, you know better than that. He said, but my heart is evil, Dad. <laughs> You're correct, son, but you still get a spanking. <laughs> now we look in the scriptures, a person cannot cleanse his or her own heart. There's no formula we can go through and check the boxes off that we can cleanse ourselves. But for some reason, as Southern Baptist and just religion in general has had us checking off the boxes for a long time. I mean, we even give out offering envelopes that have everything you have to check off the box so you think you're a good spiritual person. If you came to Bible study, you gave your offering, you shared your faith. You know what's funny? I used to sit there and fill that offering envelope out in the sanctuary and try to do all those things before the offering plate was passed. I'd get the pew Bible out and I'd read a verse or two so I said I could read, read my Bible. I'd look at my brother and share the gospel with him even though I didn't know what the gospel was so I could say I shared with my... So I could check out all the boxes because I felt like if all the boxes weren't checked, I just didn't measure up. Listen to Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? Who can purify themselves? Who can say I'm clean from my sin? And the obvious answer to that question is, no one. No one can cleanse themselves up from their sin condition. It only comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Now, if you read Deuteronomy 10, 16, it says that we're supposed to circumcise our hearts. But don't miss the meaning of this whole passage. We get to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Why? Because we can't do it ourselves. And it says, and the heart of your offspring, that's a deep message. Then it says, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. It's God who purifies our heart and God lives in us in the form of the Holy Spirit when he saves us and he plants inside of us a desire to obey God. As the Son, Jesus Christ, obeyed God in everything, now we have a desire placed inside of us in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, where if we're saved, we desire to obey God. So the question is, are you really saved? And the other question is, if you are, that means you should desire to obey God in everything. Is that the attitude of your heart? Because God has purified your heart. Or as Deuteronomy says, He circumcised your heart. Now you'll see Ezekiel 36. I love this passage of Scripture. Ezekiel 36 on the screen in your handout, verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. Remember how they did all the washings in the Old Testament. From all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. If you just stop there, you're like, okay, we can have some kind of water that washes us, some holy water that makes us clean. But then verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, the Holy Spirit. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, which means I will give you a living, pure, right heart that only comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. How can we worship God this morning 
and praise Him for what He's done for us. He's taken out our evil hearts and placed inside of us a perfect, pure, spotless heart. And we don't deserve that. We don't deserve it at all. We deserve to go to hell and pay for our sins forever. And he says, I love you enough that if you will repent of your sins and trust in me, that I will take your evil heart out and I will place a heart inside of you that's pure because I've made it pure. As Corinthians says, the old is gone, the new has come. And for that, we ought to praise God. Because we are evil from our birth. Now the last point I want you to see, and one that's probably the hardest to explain this morning, is what it means to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart who've been saved by God. God's taken their old heart out and put a new heart, His Holy Spirit inside of them. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Again, it's a future middle, which means it's now, but it'll be fully seen one day. Can we see God now? I don't think we can see God in His physical presence now, but I believe we can see God at work. We can see His hand move. We can be in the presence of God. That's why when Scripture says we're two or three gathered in His name, there I am with Him, which is hard for us to fathom sometimes because God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, but He also lives inside of us that are believers in Jesus Christ. But when two or three gather to worship Him, His presence shows up even fuller. So we can see God now, but nothing like we'll see Him one day. Do you see God now? Do you see glimpses of God now? Do you see God at work now? Do you see God saving souls of people and seeing the whole spiritual battle that was waging over that one soul? Now you see God has saved that soul and placed inside of them a pure heart and changed them from that very moment. Unbelievable. Listen to Job 42. If you have something to write with, jot that passage down. Some of y'all are studying Job in Sunday school. But listen to Job 42. Especially when we get to verse 5. I'll just read the first six verses. It says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted or stopped. Verse 3 of Job 42. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And Job says, hear and I will speak. I will question you and make it known to me. Verse 5, Job says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. And notice the last part of verse 5. But now my eyes see you. Job said, I've heard about you. But now that you've brought me through this very difficult situation and I've seen you work and move in my life, now I see you. He's not talking about the physical presence of God. He's talking about seeing God work in and through his very life. Do you see God work in and through your very life? Are you amazed at what God does through you because you know you couldn't do it on your own strength? Verse 6 of Job 42, Job says, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Don't miss the order here. When he sees God move, he sees God for who he is and how he works mightily around him and through him, then he sees his sin for the way God sees his sin, and he has to repent because he realizes he's nothing without God. It goes back to the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So do you see God now, glimpses of him, and do you really want to see him in all of his glory one day? That will change the way we worship, if you think about it. If we truly long to see God in all of His glory, then we will worship Him like we long to see Him. We will pray to Him like we long to see Him. We will read His Word as if we long to see Him. I was going to show you a video, and I decided not to this morning. And As soon as I said that, Andy probably started freaking out. He don't have a video up there to show when I said that. But There's no video this morning. You can see it on YouTube. It's an incredible video of what happened in the 60s when we were in the heat of the space race and we were trying to be the first ones in space to land on the moon and the Soviets beat us in the space race and there was a lot of competition then on the space race whoever got there first thought their science was superior and so the Soviets of course beat the United States in the space race to go to the moon and when they got there this is what they said 
We look for God. He is not there. There is no God. That's their first words back. They land on the moon. They say they look for him, but they see him nowhere. So their conclusion is there is no God. Now what's amazing, if you'll watch a YouTube video, you can see it, and you'll hear the scientists from the United States that go up that are believers in Jesus Christ, and they're looking back from the moon, and they're looking at the earth. If you know anything about what happened when they reached the moon, you'll realize they started quoting Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and there was the Spirit of God hovering above the waters. How can the Soviets beat us in the space race? They're looking back at a marble-sized earth in all of its glory from the moon, and they look for God and they see Him nowhere. But the United States astronauts land on the moon, and they look back and they see God everywhere. Because one has spiritual eyes to see God and the other one doesn't. When it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, if we have spiritual eyes to see because God has saved us, we will see God moving all around us. And we will look at things in the eternal perspective instead of the temporary perspective. And we'll see how important it is for one lost person that's on the way to hell to be saved. And we'll be overjoyed when one lost sinner comes home. And we know the angels in heaven rejoice. And we'll rejoice with the angels in heaven because we see the things through the eyes of God. So it's a very deep meaning this morning that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now we see Him through spiritual eyes. One day we'll see Him with our physical eyes and all of His glory. Do you want to see God move around you right now? Do you want to see God work in and through you right now? It only happens when He purifies our hearts. It only happens when He's truly saved us. And there's so many people that think they're on the way to heaven, but they're trying to earn God's approval, and they've never let God purify their hearts. They never really trusted in Christ. They never repented of their sin and trusted in Christ. I told you we were at World Changers two weeks ago in Nashville, and a, a lady from World Changers got up and she shared her testimony. And when she shared her testimony, she said this. She said, I accepted Jesus as Savior, and then a year later I accepted her as Lord. And when she said that, all of our group went, what? Which I was so proud of. Because our students knew that you can't trust Christ as your Savior and not trust Him as your Lord. But that's what she said in her testimony, that it was a year later before she trusted God as Lord, but a year before that she was saved. You can't take one without the other. Jesus is either your Savior and Lord, or He's neither. And so many people do not want to go to hell they want to go to heaven. So when somebody says, hey, you need to pray a prayer, which is nowhere recorded in the Scripture to be saved, and you've got to come down the aisle, and you've got to do it like we've taught you how to do it, and you've got to repeat the prayer after me, or as we do in vacation Bible schools, if you go through the ABCs, you're saved. That's not recorded in the Scriptures either. And we tell them they can have heaven and not hell. They come and they go through the motions, but they never trust in Christ as Lord, so therefore they never really got saved. And they're trying to purify their own hearts. And they're trying to clean them, themselves up and they have all these habits that are sinful in their life and they're trying harder to not do them and they will never be able to not do them because they do not have the power of God flowing through their life because they're truly not saved. And Jesus is talking to a bunch of disciples but the overflow is hitting the religious leaders in this Sermon on the Mount and they're saying, hey, we do all the purification rituals. In terminology today, that means we go to church and we go through the motions. But then he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the religious leaders, I'm sure, were upset because they knew what it meant to purify the outside, but inwardly, they were whitewashed sepulchers, Jesus said. Hearts of stone. They needed a real heart, Jesus, to give them a cleansed heart, a purified heart, a new heart. Hear me this morning. Unless Jesus has purified your heart, you're not saved. Unless Jesus Christ has cleansed you and made you whole, you are not saved. I don't care what religious observance you followed. I don't care how many times you walked the aisle. I don't care how many times you were baptized. Unless you've repented of your sins and truly trusted in Christ, He has not saved you. 
And if he saved you, oh, you know it. Amen. If he's taken your evil heart out and put a new heart in, oh, there's no doubt whatsoever in your mind. When the old is gone, the new has come, it's evident. That's why I can't contain myself. I can't mention Eli, who's coming up in a moment in the invitation time. To see her in my office over the last several weeks and see the enemy waging war over her soul because he did not want her to get saved and see the spiritual battle ensue and the pain that she went through and then to walk in my office this morning because she got saved a couple days ago and see the joy that's in her heart and life. You can't describe that. Only God can do that. We can't do that on our own strength. But you know how many people have walked an aisle and said a prayer and got baptized and never had a change? Because they're just going through the motions? Because they said the ABCs at Vacation Bible School? Because somebody said, hey, if you don't want to go to hell, raise your hand. Okay, no, no, everybody here wants to go to heaven. That's great. Now everybody repeat the prayer after me. If you said that prayer, raise your hand. Okay, you're all saved. We'll baptize you next Sunday. No, there has to be a true decision in your heart to turn from your sin and trust in Christ. How do I know that? Because you've heard my testimony if you've been coming to church here in the last several weeks I've been your pastor. That was me at the age of 10. Walked the aisle, said the prayer, lived the lie, and for 11 years was lost as lost can be. But I was religious. I could quote you scripture. If the doors were open to the church, I was there. If you looked at my life, it was a decent moral life on the outside. But if you knew my heart, oh. If you knew my thoughts, if you knew the intention of my thoughts, you would know that there was nothing changed in my life. But we can play a pretty good game. We can put on a pretty good facade. We can make people think because we've washed, out the, washed the outside up that we've got it all together. But only Christ is the one who changes a heart. Only Christ is the one who makes the difference. And I'm begging you this morning that if you've never trusted in Christ, to let Him purify your heart this morning so you can see glimpses of God right now. You can see through spiritual eyes, but one day see Him face to face. Matthew 7, 21. We're going to get to it in the Sermon on the Mount. One of the scariest verses in all of God's Word. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That doesn't mean we earn our salvation. That means there's several people that say God's the Lord of their life, but He's not. They wanted salvation. They didn't want hell. They wanted heaven. But they've never truly trusted in God as the boss, master, owner of their life. They do not let God control their life. They control their own life. They think they're saved, but they're not. And since they're not saved, they have no desire in them because the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in them. They have no desire to obey God. I guarantee you there's at least one person like that here this morning that's playing the religious game. And right now the Holy Spirit's convicting your heart. He's tugging at you and drawing you to salvation. But the choice is up to you to respond or reject God. And He wants you to respond. He wants you to truly be saved this morning. He desperately desires to cleanse you from your evil heart and place inside of you a pure heart. A heart that's after God. A heart that longs to be all that God would have you to be. Does it mean you're perfect after you're saved? No. But it means you long to be that and you live more out of sin than you do in sin. You know how we as Christians like to say, well, I just can't help it. I just, you know, by the grace of God, He forgives me, but I just keep on sinning. And we spend 99% of our supposedly Christian life in sin and about 1% out instead of the other way around. Are you with me this morning? If we're saved, Christ lives in us and gives us victory over sin. Yes, we may stumble and fall, but more times than not, we're obeying God, not disobeying God and just making excuses. We can't just help ourselves. Because Christ purifies us. Christ empowers us. Christ gives us victory over sin. So much so that when we sin, we are broken over it. And we can't live in it because it breaks our heart because it breaks the heart of God. So I don't want you to think if you get saved this morning that you're going to be sinless because there's a lot of people that teach that and they use Matthew 5, 48 that says, Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And they misinterpret that passage that we'll get to in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. We will not be perfect till we see Christ face to face one day. 
But we should have a desire when he gives us a clean heart. We know what an evil heart's like. He gives us a clean heart, and we want to obey God because we love him more in life itself. We will hate sin because God hates sin. We will see our sin for what it did to Jesus on the cross at Calvary, and we will weep when we sin. And when we come to church and the Word is preached and we're singing songs and the Holy Spirit is evident in this place, we will be drawn to drop to our knees and be remorseful over our sin. Be in agony over our sin. You know, the Bible says in the book of John that the true worshipers worship Him in spirit and in truth. So often we just go through the outward, physical manifestation of what we call worship and we fail to worship Him in spirit and in truth, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, to our spirits, that's what it means to worship Him in spirit and in truth. That might mean raising your hands. That may, might mean falling on your face before God. It might mean leaving this place and going and reconciling with the brother or sister that you have something against or they have something against you. It will manifest itself in different ways at different times, but it will manifest itself. Oh, it breaks my heart as your pastor to know one day we'll all stand before Jesus Christ and somebody that I could have been their pastor can go to a real hell forever because they never let Christ purify their hearts. That keeps me up at night. That keeps me on my knees in the morning praying for you and praying for people that might come here that they won't go through the religious game and think they're going to go to heaven one day and be sorely mistaken on the day of judgment. I just, I've had dreams growing up in the last seven or eight years as a pastor, and I've got a lot more growing up to do, but I've had dreams of what it would be like to stand in the judgment and see somebody that's in the church that's, that I've preached the word to time and time again who do not go to heaven but go to hell because they've never placed their trust in Jesus Christ. You know, I've been at churches before where people say, Brother Ricky, you preach the gospel way too much. We understand the gospel. Move on to something else. What else is there but the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, if we don't preach the gospel, there could be one person that's lost in this congregation that stays lost and they never hear the gospel. So I beg you, during the invitation time this morning, if you're saved, cry out to God that the lost person that's in this room will finally turn from their sin and let Christ save them. And if you're the lost person in the room, I guarantee there's at least one this morning with the size of the congregation this morning they might be religious or they've never even walked in the door of a church for today. But they know they've never let Jesus Christ save them and purify them of their sin. I beg you to choose Jesus today. He wants to save you, but He doesn't force Himself on anyone. He leaves the choice up to us to reject Him or to respond to Him. And my prayer is that you respond to Him at this very moment. Let's pray.